Ah oui, effectivement. <laughs> good afternoon, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this uh, official past council press conference with FIFA President Gianni Infantino. Um, is a translation system working? We have German, French, English, Spanish. Does it work for everyone? Good news. Then we can start with uh, opening remarks from uh, FIFA president, and then you will have time to ask the questions you want to ask. Mr. President. Thank you uh, very much. Merci. Fabrice. Fabrice. Welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to have you all here interested in uh, football or soccer. And let me start uh, by thanking, of course, uh, uh, our hosts here, uh, US Soccer Federation, Carlos Cordero, president who is here with us, CONCACAF with Vittorio Montagliani as well, for having us here in uh, Miami for this important council meeting. So today, you have in front of you a happy FIFA president. I'm always happy, as you know, or those of you who know me, but today I'm particularly happy, not for me, but uh, for world football, because we have taken an important decision. We've taken several decisions, several important decisions, but one particularly important because uh, we will have, as of uh, 2021, a new real, not only revamp, but real Club World Cup, which uh, will certainly have uh, a fantastic impact on uh, club football worldwide, on football worldwide. <clears throat> and uh, I'm uh, extremely happy today that uh, the Council has taken this decision, which is to start in 2021 with uh, a new Club World Cup, a revamped Club World Cup, in the slot of uh, the Confederations Cup, so from, uh, I think, 17th of June to 4th of July or something along these dates of 2021 in two and a half years. From now, the world will see a real Club World Cup where the best teams in the club will compete to crown the club world champion. This is important uh, today because, of course, um, club football is evolving, is moving at different pace in different parts of the world, and it is our duty and our responsibility to make sure that um, we encourage professional club football all over the world. And uh, what more, what better than having a real club football and not a competition like the one we have now. We want to have an exciting competition. We want to have a prestigious competition. We want to have an inclusive competition for clubs. And uh, we will have this with the new um, Club World Cup starting in 2021, so I'm very, very happy that this decision has been taken. This decision has been taken after uh, a long process, after a lot of um, consultations, a lot of discussions, a lot of different opinions and different views, and today I'm also pleased uh, because uh, there have been some very positive discussions lately uh, with the uh, UEFA president, with UEFA. Constructive dialogue, even though, of course, uh, there are on some topics different points of view, but we are moving, we are moving forward. We had the responsibility, we have the responsibility to take decisions for FIFA, and we took the decision, and I'm sure that uh, uh, in the next few weeks, um, even the discussions with UEFA uh, will bear some positive fruits. Certainly, this is the spirit of uh, today's meeting and of uh, 
the most recent uh, discussions we had. So constructive, positive, but uh, more importantly, FIFA has decided. And we are moving on. And uh, actually, I, 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 I can share with you a little secret now, which is that uh, when I was campaigning to become FIFA president, and I don't know if any one of you was there, I presented my manifesto in uh, London, in Wembley, and I presented 10 topics. And an 11th topic, which I said I will not say what this 11th topic is, and this 11th topic was a Club World Cup. So this has also been done in, uh, in the meantime. And this is what, what uh, will remain, and this is, I think, uh, really a milestone in the history of FIFA, a milestone in the history of uh, worldwide club football. And I think we can all be pleased and enjoy uh, what is coming uh, towards us if we see the impact that the World Cup has had, for example, last summer in Russia, the national team, uh, World Cup, uh, we can certainly foresee something very similar for clubs. Uh, uh, there are clubs today which are more than just representing a city or a country or a continent. They are really representing the world. They are world selections and uh, I think it's positive that uh, players coming from all over the world can strive to become once in their lifetime world champions. So I think this is the main reason why uh, today I'm so happy. I'm also happy because uh, we took some other decisions and I just want to walk you through them very briefly and then of course you can ask any question you would like. The other topic which was uh, uh, making some headlines in the recent past was the World Cup Qatar 2022. We have uh, published um, to uh, our council members a, a feasibility study, which is quite a thorough document, where we came to the conclusion that uh, yes, it is feasible to move the World Cup in 2022 from 32 to 48 teams. It's feasible, provided, of course, certain conditions are met. So to be very clear, today we have a World Cup in Qatar of 32 teams, and this is great like this. However, since we decided uh, already in January 2017 that we should increase the number of teams participating in the World Cup from 32 to 48. This will happen as of 2026. And following a request received by the 10 South American associations last year, well, we are looking into the matter and seeing whether it's possible, whether it is feasible to anticipate this already in 22. If it is feasible, if it is possible, great. If it is not feasible, if it is not possible, great. But I think as FIFA, we have the duty to look into that. We consulted all our associations. 90% are, of course, in favor of an increase. Um, but it's not uh, uh, as easy as that. You cannot just uh, uh, take a simple decision. You have to analyze these matters very carefully. And we are working very closely with uh, Qatar to see what uh, uh, proposals can be made. What is clear is that if we were to increase to 48 teams, and we will decide this in June, then some games would have to be hosted by some neighboring countries of Qatar. And we, together with uh, our partners from Qatar, will present uh, eventually a proposal in this, um, in this respect. We all know, of course, uh, the situation in the region, in the Gulf region. But you know, we are in the lucky position of being in football. And when you're in football, you can uh, care only about football. And uh, I was very pleased by the reaction of uh, the Qataris the first time this idea was shared with them because they were open to it. And their reaction was, well, if you think at FIFA, the football associations around the world, that this is positive for football, of course, we'll happily look into that together and see what can be done. 
And this is exactly the attitude that uh, uh, we like, a constructive attitude, a positive attitude. We look into it. Again, if it happens, fantastic. If it doesn't happen, fantastic as well. But at least we don't have to regret that we didn't uh, analyze this question. So we move to the next stage of this. We will explore the possibility of who could potentially be hosting some of the games in, uh, in, the, in the Gulf region. And if we come to some conclusions in uh, June, we'll make a proposal to the Council and, of course, to the Congress, who is our ultimate decision-making body, who can then uh, take the final uh, decision on this topic. For the rest, very important as well, we got an update on the Women's World Cup. This, by the way, is the official ball for the Women's World Cup. Oh. Where is it? Here it is. The official ball of the Women's World Cup, which will take place from the 7th of June to the 7th of July next year in France. France, the country of the world champions, men's world champion. Let's see if they perform as good with the women's as well. Uh, the work, preparation work is uh, going very, very well. Well, we had no doubt about that. France is France, and everyone likes to go to France. And this summer, you have one more reason to go to France, and an important reason to cheer for your national team, 24 national teams, US is world champion. And uh, one of the novelties of this Women's World Cup will be that we will be using VAR for the Women's World Cup as well, the same as we did for the Men's World Cup. We received some questions on this matter already some uh, months ago. We didn't answer because uh, at FIFA, we want to do our job in a professional and in a serious way. So we mandated our refereeing committee and our administration to study the question. They made several workshops, several training sessions with uh, referees for the World Cup. And uh, the outcome of all these training sessions was, yes, we can. Yes, we can, and yes, we will use the VAR at the Women's World Cup. So this is certainly a positive news. We have decided as well that India will host the next Under-17 Women's World Cup in uh, uh, 2020. And uh, Brazil will be hosting, at the end of this year, the FIFA Under-17 Boys World Cup. We have then decided uh, some tournament dates for the Futsal World Cup in Lithuania, uh, 12th of September to 4th of October 2020, for the Beach Soccer World Cup in Paraguay this year, from 21st of November to 1st of December. And uh, we have presented to the Council as well the process uh, for the selection of the hosts <clears throat> of the Women's World Cup 2023, for which the declarations of interest uh, finished today. So we have already, I don't know, six or seven, six, seven, eight, six, seven, seven associations uh, who have declared their interest. The others who still want to declare their interest, they still have a couple of hours. But it shows that there is a great interest in hosting uh, the Women's World Cup, bearing in mind that Europe cannot host it because this World Cup is in uh, France, by the way. Uh, we have already sold more than half a million tickets for the World Cup in France, and we are targeting one billion viewers for this World Cup uh, as well on a worldwide um, basis. We have... Uh, as well, um, approved the different reports, which will go to the Congress, the activity report, the governance report, and the financial report with uh, extremely, extremely positive figures. You will see them in the report, and uh, I think it's important to underline that um, when it comes to the finances of FIFA, 
FIFA is today as solid, as strong and as transparent as it has never been before. Just look at the financial reports, the governance report, the activity reports and all the information you can find therein. But when it comes to figures, I would just like to underline three of the main uh, figures that uh, can be found in these uh, reports. The first one is that uh, we increased with the forward program the development funds available to the member associations for football development, passing from uh, 326 million to more than 1 billion in this cycle. And in the new cycle, which will start in January, we are moving this up to 1.75 billion US dollars. So in four years, we are moving from uh, 320 million to 1.8 billion investment in football development, which is where the money of FIFA has to go. It has to go in football development. In terms of project, this means that we moved from an average of 30 projects on a worldwide basis per year to over 400 projects on a worldwide basis per year. And this is important because there are half of the associations in the world who could not organize football, men's and women's, boys and girls, without these funds. And it is normal that we invest this money in football development. <clears throat> and this is the first figure. The second figure I want to mention is about the revenues. I remember many were saying when I was elected, not to me, but generally, well, nobody will want to be associated with FIFA ever again because it's such a negative gang. And the image of FIFA was tarnished and was at probably its lowest ever. But uh, as I'm a, an optimistic person and I have uh, a great team and I have a great council as well, well, we took this challenge and instead of the budgeted 5 billion US dollar revenues in this period and it ending in uh, December 2018, we reached 6.4 billion revenues, 1.4 billion more than what was budgeted in the period of the worst crisis of FIFA. So I think this is quite encouraging for the future as well. And we did this and we increased the solidarity payments with the Fural program in a very conservative way as well, raising the accountability of each country. We are auditing all 211 countries today, which was not the case before. And uh, as well, I was hearing uh, some saying, well, in order to fulfill all these promises of football development, you need to eat from the reserves that FIFA has. So we'd just like to remind everyone that the reserves of FIFA, when I arrived in FIFA, were at 1 billion US dollars. Two years before, they were at 1.5. Today, the reserves of FIFA are at 2.745 billion US dollars. So in spite of multiplying by four or five the development programs, our reserves have increased to an unprecedented level of 2.7 billion. Now, of course, we don't need 2.7 billion in a Swiss bank, even though they would certainly be happy to have all that money in the bank. We need this money to be reinvested back into the game. So now that we have been conservative, we will start working to see how we can reinvest part of these reserves back into football development all over the world. And I think it's important at the end of a cycle, which ended in October, in, uh, sorry, in December of last year, to look a little bit back. And even though I was president for only three out of the four years, the results speak for themselves uh, on the financial side, on the sporting side, with the best World Cup ever organized in Russia and many, many, many other projects. So I think we are on the right track. I think we are moving fast. I think 
we are moving positively uh, for FIFA, for the world football community, and uh, I'm personally very proud of uh, our achievements. And I think I have said more or less everything that I had to say and it was discussed uh, at today's meeting, and the floor is, of course, yours. And if I forgot something, I'm sure Fabrice will tell me and I will uh, add it. No? I think it was perfect, so no, no need for question. Have a nice day. No, it's a joke. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so now we can start with your questions. So please uh, raise your hand, tell us who you're working for, and maybe we will start with Ruben Rodriguez on my right. Hola, From Fox. Ruben Rodriguez de Fox Sports. ¿Cómo está? Saludarle. Eh, Regresando un poquito al tema de, de, de la Copa del 2021, cup, it's going to be like the Confederations Cup with a host in Qatar, or will there be a group of host countries? Will it be wide, and will the cup be wider in terms of clubs, of participants? Uh, I have another question. 48 countries in a World Cup will be a far broader cup, and it will require many more resources, more income, more resources to use. No. <laughs> no. But let me go um, to your first question first. La decisión que hemos tomado hoy es de jugar en lugar de la Copa de Confederaciones. Is to play instead of the Confederations Cup to use the window of the Confederations Cup for the World Club Cup with all the teams from around the world. That's for 2021, and then four years later, we'll talk about the new calendar with all the parties concerned. And we'll then decide how we're going to organize the uh, World Club competition as of that time. For 2021, we'll start in that manner. We're not going to go to Qatar because it's uh, June and July, so it's really a bit too hot. And that's the decision why in 2022, the event will take place uh, in November and December, and we'll see where this first version, this first real world version, club version, will be held in the world. But it will have a phenomenal impact. All football fans, putting politics to one side, all football fans are going to enjoy it to the hilt. As to the 2022 event, well, when it comes to income, to resources, that's not a, a the really decisive point for the simple reason that we already have a lot of signed contracts for 2022. What we want, in fact, and what we said in council and what we have said at the various summits with the confederations around the world, we don't want to lose money. With an additional 16 teams, that means there will be greater expenditure, of course, but also more income. And we are firmly convinced of the fact that, uh, roughly speaking, the expenditure will co be covered by income. So we'll be receiving more money, and 16 more countries in the world will have an opportunity to participate in the most important football event in the world. It's a huge party, so to speak. A further 16 teams, that means 40, 50, 60 teams uh, or countries that can dream about participating that can hope uh, to qualify. There'll be a real, real opportunity to qualify. Let's not forget that at the last World Cup in Russia, for example, we had teams like Italy, four times champion of the world, which wasn't qualified, Holland, Often, which often reached the finals but didn't qualify. Chile, Chile, Chile 
South uh, American champion didn't qualify, U.S. Uh, champion didn't qualify, Cameroon African champion didn't uh, uh, qualify. These are all teams, and this, these are just examples of teams that have won their continental competition. They won against all the teams on their continent which were qualified, but it didn't qualify for the World Cup. That shows that uh, the quality of football in the world is incredibly high now. And we have to take all this into consideration. And those were the main lines along which we thought. And uh, the more the merrier. It's great. Thank you. Gentlemen, just there who raised their hand with the glasses. Buenos dias. Good afternoon. I come from Spain. I wanted to ask about the recent news about supposed payments referring to Qatar and the cup there. Um, has this matter been dealt with? What's the status uh, in terms of uh, FIFA? For the past 10 years, people have been talking about all this, and I wasn't uh, at FIFA when people started to talk about such matters, in fact. When uh, we took office, thanks also to the decision taken by the new president of the Ethics Committee of FIFA, we decided to publish in Mr. Garcia's report, we wanted everything to be totally open and transparent. But if some people want to continue with these uh, uh, rumors or things, well, we can't do much about that. Had there been something really there, given the amount of time so many people have been looking into the matter, this would be known. The UEFA clubs apparently uh, said no. Atletico de Madrid, Real de Madrid have qualified as champions uh, the last uh, league, but not Barcelona, and that's a bit odd. Well, the ranking systems uh, or things we'll be talking about together with UEFA, of course, as well. And presumably, obviously, Spain has three uh, teams which will have wonderful opportunities to be fully represented and uh, they play at top level so we'll see what really happens this year in the champions as well so we'll see but i'm sure that uh, the teams will be at top level i hope they won't all be from spain i hope there'll be teams that qualify from other countries too thank you ESPN. Then we have Martin from Globo and Tariq Pania from New York Times, and then we will see. Good afternoon, José Valles. ECA has said that European clubs are not going to participate in the club uh, cup. Uh, can you guarantee that uh, with 24 teams in this cup, uh, there will be all the top-level teams? And what about uh, the football stance? If you have 48 teams, we'll have to do away with the uh, qualifying rounds of Colmabal, where there are only seven in the event. Uh, six and a half, in fact. <laughs> well, on the whole, you have people from Conmebol uh, which qualify. So you were giving some examples like Chile, the US, and Italy, and Holland, which didn't qualify for the World Cup. But uh, in Russia in 2018, there were five African teams, and none of them qualified and got into the second uh, round. Only one from CONCACAF. There were many in the Asians. Only one got through the following round. So we don't want to undermine the quality of uh, uh, viewerships. The quality is there, and uh, it will be memorable events. We added an initial knockout round, in fact. Uh, we have groups of four currently, and then 16. There will be 32 teams, and we all know that uh, football is the only sport in the world where, in 90 minutes, 
anything and everything can happen. So this world event uh, will be absolutely incredible. It will be fabulous. There will be all sorts of surprises, many more, in fact, than now with groups of four, where you have to play well in four, three matches in order to move on to the next stage. So when it comes to quality, I do firmly believe that 48 teams is the perfect number. And we've already decided on the, the 48. As of 2026, it'll be 48. What we're talking about now is whether this can be possible in 2022 which is another issue. As to the uh, World Club uh, Cup, we hope that all the greatest teams will participate. As I said earlier on, we've held uh, some very positive, constructive discussions and will continue in this vein. And the vision of FIFA and the FIFA presidency is that um, we should, insofar as possible, include everybody and the best team should have this world platform in order to uh, excel as champions of the world. So we'll continue our discussions, but it's our responsible, it's responsibility today to take a decision because we're uh, talking about two and a, in two and a half years' time and we have to deal with the organizational matters and so on. Thank you. President Martin Fernandez de Globo, Brazil. I would like to talk about 2019-2022, where we'll have, use the old format. What do you think about the Copa de America? We've been talking about the U.S. and uh, invitations from Australia to hold this in Australia. So what do you think, in fact, about the current situation in terms of other continents organizing the Copa de America? America in uh, a few years' time. Well, I think that first and foremost, all football fans should feel happy that uh, it's Brazil which will host the event this year. Let's not forget that fact. And you uh, are probably from Brazil, so I'm sure that you view this as very important. And it's important for all football fans around the world. And I love South American football like other football fans. And having a competition in Brazil is absolutely fabulous. The decision was taken to enable CONMEBOL to participate in a competition in 2020 uh, uh, and then move on to even years and hold uh, this every four years. There are discussions underway, of course. But this doesn't uh, behoove FIFA to decide. It's a matter for the confederations. It's a matter for CONMEBOL. Uh, Copa de America was held in the U.S. It was a resounding success as well. And so, once again, as a football fan, I'm very happy indeed to see these major teams from around the world uh, play in these events as president of FIFA. I hope that uh, leaders will find the best possible solution, whatever it may be. It's not a matter that behooves FIFA, it's a matter that behooves the confederations, and I'm sure their decision will be the right one. We have uh, in the middle Tariq Pania, then we have Simon Evans, then we will move smoothly to the left to Miguel Hernandez and Philip Sommer and go back to the center. I've seen you, Rob Harris. Johnny, a question in English, if that's all right, if you can answer in English. Thank you. Quite useful. Um, cup, two, three short questions, actually. You, know, you, had, one? you had, uh, you had um, a happy present, big deal today, Club World Cup, important day for FIFA. Is it strange that two vice presidents didn't bother showing up for such a big day in terms of governance? There should be. Uh, that's what. That's the first question. Let me let me just finish the the, the, the other ones. Worth. That's all right. Um, and then in terms of the quality of the the forty eight teams, the last feasibility study for forty eight teams, it actually said that the quality would be diminished a bit in the last FIFA study. This study seems to say that the quality isn't changed. Is it different people did it, or what? I'm just trying to understand how the um, 
how they come up with it actually not affecting quality when they thought it did before when you went to 2026. And, and the, the last quick one, um, you have a um, deal for the Middle East TV rights, as does UEFA, with being media. And um, so does the Asian Football Confederation, which last week unilaterally broke that agreement so they could show games in, in Saudi Arabia. What, what do you think of that? What do you think that does to the TV market? Are you guys going to be under similar pressure? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, what was the first question? Ah, the VPs are not here. Ah, the VPs are not here. You know, you were complaining that we have too many council members, and when uh, a few less come, uh, then... Uh, uh, it's 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 a problem as well. No, I'm not uh, I'm not worried at all because I've been in contact, a uh, uh, regular contact with uh, with both of them and the other members uh, of the council. Three uh, three other members of the council, I think, were not uh, present as well. Um, and uh, uh, you know, I know what their views is, what their opinion is, and uh, they had valid reasons for not uh, being able to to come, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, we are 37 members. We uh, decide, uh, of course, we take uh, uh, always the input of everyone on board, in particular Confederation presidents who have been well represented by the other members, by their vice presidents as well of their own confederations. And uh, uh, from that perspective, uh, for me, this is, I would say, business as usual. I'm not uh, uh, the only one who probably has to be there but even, even that is maybe not necessary. the president of FIFA, right, um, for the rest. Uh, the more, the better, but sometimes for some people it's not possible, you know, to come and they have uh, good uh, reasons for, uh, for not coming. On, uh, on the two sides, well, honestly, I don't remember the previous study, if it was saying it diminishes the quality. I'm looking at those who did this study and did the old one as well, they are both saying like this, that it was not the case, that it's not true, that it was not diminishing. I don't know. Uh, I, I, from the beginning, I didn't think it would diminish the quality. Of course, you know, you can say that if you make a World Cup with two teams and you take the two best teams in the world, then you have the best quality. As soon as you have four, it's maybe a little bit less. So, uh, you know, you can, you can argue uh, about it. I think I have shown with some examples that uh, the quality is is there. We have been having, I mean, uh, the usual Iceland example who kicks out uh, uh, England in the Euro. Uh, you know, we, we, we have we have many examples. Croatia is not really a football powerhouse, I think. Sorry, Mr. Boban. They just managed once to become third in the World Cup, thanks to uh, Boban here and some others. But they reached the final, and they played a great, great World Cup. And this is full, a country of four million people. So I think uh, you know, progress has been made in many parts of the world in the recent past. And I'm sure that uh, we will see some, some uh, you know, more surprises in the future as well. But it's our job at FIFA as well to contribute to the development of football. And this is the reason, the main reason, why we decided to go to 48 team to start with. If you are in Asia, for example, and you have four slots of four teams that qualify, and you have 46 countries, including some big countries, right? Out of the four, you have, I don't know, Korea, Japan, uh, Iran, who qualify all the time because they are historically always good. So you have kind of one spot for 43 countries. How can you seriously say to these people, well, invest in football because maybe one day you will qualify for the World Cup if you have only one spot for 43? It's not the right thing to do. So I think our duty is to develop football. In the Olympic Games, you have 210 countries participating in the World Cup you will have uh, 48 as of 26. 48 is still only 23% of the members. If you compare it with uh, the Euro, 24 teams out of 55, almost 50%. If you compare it with the Copa America, 10 out of 10, 100%. Uh, I don't know, the African Cup of Nations, 24 
out of 54, again, almost 50%. Asian Cup, 24 out of 46, more than 50%. I think we, are still, we still have some margin to increase uh, in the future. Uh, the number of teams. But jokes aside, I, I, I really think it's, uh, it's positive for football because it will boost the development and with the development you boost the quality as well. And TV contract? TV contract, uh, well, I don't know. I, I, uh, we have, yes, uh, uh, contracts with, uh, with uh, being in place uh, the next time that these contracts will uh, how should I say, have an effect will be uh, during the World Cup in uh, almost four years from now. So, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, I, I, don't see, I, I don't see the, the issue that you're mentioning to, I don't know what AFC has done or not done, um, or certainly not in the detail. I've been certainly reading something, but, what AFC does is like what UEFA does, what Comnebol does. They are all grown up, and they can do. They can take their own decisions. We will. Uh, we have contracts in place. We are always respecting our contracts, and uh, um, yeah. And for the rest, the more competition there is, uh, the more uh, contracts we have, the more partners we have, the better it is for football. Simon. Thanks. Yeah, on, on the European Club Association, they, they weren't just saying that they weren't going to play in this tournament. They also said that, that they have a formal agreement with FIFA in which they said any decision, uh, any changes on the international match calendar requires explicit consent from ECA. Has, has that changed now? You can organise this tournament without, without their consent because from what they've been telling everybody, they don't consent to this. And, and secondly, on, on FIFA Pro have said that the recovery time that professional footballers need in tournaments is, is 72 hours between games. Can you guarantee that in a 48-team World Cup, or are they, are they wrong about that? Of course we can guarantee uh, the necessary recovery time uh, for players, as it is the case today, throughout the whole season. So we are speaking here, let me just remind you, we are speaking here about a two-week tournament being played every four years. A tournament which actually replaces five other tournaments. We are the only organization in the world, FIFA, who is reducing, not increasing, reducing the number of games. Two weeks every four years replacing another tournament. This alone shows that this has a positive impact and not a negative or even not a neutral impact on the international match calendar. It has a positive impact on the international match calendar. It is played in a slot which already exists. Okay, but then you shouldn't mix up the questions. Huh? I will answer about the recovery time in Qatar as well. Um, so, we are putting it in a slot which already exists. We are not creating a new slot. We are not creating uh, some additional burden. Out of uh, 24 teams in the format that we have uh, prepared for the Club World Cup, two-thirds will play only two games. The winner will play five games in four years. I don't think anyone can say that this is a big additional burden, because it is not. Again, it is actually reducing the burden. And, you know, we went through a consultation process. We spoke with everyone. We spoke with the leagues, we spoke with the clubs, we spoke with the players, we spoke with the associations, we spoke with the confederations. Some agree, others disagree. Some say they agree, but then they write they disagree. Others say they disagree, but then they write that they agree. You have different views and different positions. When uh, the World Cup was created in 1930, uh, I remember uh, that some associations who had funded or created football didn't even want to participate. And then ultimately now everyone is very happy and is participating. I remember when the Champions League was created, 
the leagues, the associations in Europe were saying this will kill football, it will kill national football, domestic football, it's a disaster and everyone, and today, 20 years later, 30 years later, everyone says what a great idea that was to create the Champions League, right? And to develop it in the way, of course, it has developed. So, uh, you know, as I said, I am uh, um, certainly not here to fuel uh, or to put fuel on any uh, situation. I respect the positions and the views of everyone. I'm uh, feeling very positive from uh, the discussions that I had, and I'm sure that uh, at the end, uh, you know, we will all be very happy. The players, the clubs, the leagues, the associations, the confederations will all be very happy with a new competition which is in the landscape, which increases the value, not the financial value, but the value and the impact of football on a worldwide basis. On uh, uh, the 48 teams World Cup, yes, the formats that, uh, uh, that we have designed guarantee the same number of days, uh, the same number of matches in the same number of days. We would have to play, of course, more games. That's why we need more stadia, up to six games. Uh, per day, but it is nothing different to what is happening today in uh, all the other competitions. Miguel. Good afternoon, sir. Hola. Mr. Infantino. Hello. I wanted to ask what your opinion was currently about the moment when this press conference is taking place when we've seen that there's been a terrorist attack in New Zealand, and I wanted to know your opinion on the matter. I want to know what you felt about this. And second, I wanted to ask you the following. But here in the US, at the FIFA Council is taking place here, I wanted to, to talk about the importance of this meeting in, and the fact it's being held in the US and your opinion on the matter. And thirdly, your predecessors were a member of the International Olympic Committee. This is something that's very important. Sorry, I forgot to uh, represent, uh, to introduce myself from an Olympic platform. Could you talk a bit more about the progress that has been made? Given Gracias. your position, well, thank you. In English, uh, if you allow, because uh, um, you mentioned the, the terrible um, tragedy which happened uh, earlier today in, uh, in uh, New Zealand. I've been to New Zealand, I was there last week, um, and uh, it was for the first time actually in, in, in my life, and I've seen uh, um, a beautiful country, I've seen uh, people living uh, together in, in harmony from different ethnicities uh, and different religions, and, uh, and I was really pleased with that visit in New Zealand and uh, this morning when, uh, when I woke up and when I saw the news I felt like everyone, I think, speechless. It's a terrible tragedy. Our sympathy goes, of course, with the families, with the friends of those who have lost their lives. These are events, incidents, tragedies that we would never like to witness. Human beings uh, who have uh, been done so many good things in the world are also capable of the worst, as we have sadly seen. And uh, at this moment, I think it's just the time for um, thinking on, on the victims, for thinking on their families for sending them a big hug, even though words cannot help, cannot heal, cannot do anything. And uh, trying to uh, take also this incident, as many others, as lessons for all of us, to try to be a little bit better, to try to be a little bit more open and more tolerant in the world, and I don't want to say football contributes to that, it's not the moment for this stuff. 
it's just a moment of mourning, it's the moment of uh, thinking, of sitting down, of putting the priorities again right. And uh, I think this is yeah, what I want to say about uh, this terrible tragedy in, uh, in New Zealand. On uh, what was the other? On, on the IOC, well, I don't know exactly how the procedures are uh, for the IOC uh, membership and so on, but I have a great contact with Thomas Bach, the president of the IOC, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm very busy as FIFA president, he's very busy as IOC president, we are occasionally meeting and we have a good time together and uh, you know, we, we work both for the development of sport and uh, you know, we will see uh, what happens in the future as for any potential membership of, of IOC. But I'm already happy as FIFA president, I'm happy that I'm the only candidate for the re-election or for election on the 5th of June so I can continue my work. Uh, and continue developing football. The third question was sobre qué era? Miami. Miami, yeah, Miami, Miami. La significación. Yeah, to be in Miami. Uh, it's important to be in Miami. It's important to be in Miami because it's the uh, headquarter of uh, CONCACAF. I thanked before Vittorio Montagliani, you were not here, but uh, so I can repeat it now, in addition to thanking Carlos Cordero. Uh, it's important to be in Miami because it is a, a, a soccer city, right? It is a city which is today a world capital, an international city, a city that everyone uh, enjoys to go. And it's important to be in the United States because the uh, United States, together with Mexico and Canada, will host the World Cup in 2026. And this World Cup will be incredible, will be amazing. Uh, and we can see it, we can see it when you are here. I met uh, the mayor of Miami uh, day before yesterday. Uh, I spoke with many people in the city and you can see that football or soccer is really, really growing and these are not only, not only words. And our job at FIFA is to grow football, I was saying it worldwide. And of course, the United States of America has to play a crucial role in the development of football worldwide not only with the organization of the World Cup, but with everything we can do from now until the World Cup. This council meeting is part of that, but we will do much, much more. And also beyond, uh, beyond that, that World Cup. So I don't know, the slogan, uh, since we are in the United States, can be uh, for soccer, make America great. Not, not again, because it was not great before, it was okay, <laughs> but now let's make it great in America. <laughs> <laughs> Don't quote me on that, huh? Hi, hi Johnny. Philip Sommer from ARD Television. I would like to ask in German, if that's okay, if you might answer in German, it would be great. I don't know. Trans there is translation? In no, there? no translation. Or there is a translation, I'll yes. I'll try. Herr Infantino, vor Wochen Mr. Infantino, haben sich noch a few weeks ago, UEFA the colleagues of UEFA, they rejected this Club World uh, Cup. Now they agreed, obviously. Uh, but you, what about, how did you include the UEFA in your consultations? Yes, there was, uh, there was a vote and UEFA didn't agree, but UEFA uh, understood the process that we were going through. I think we had positive, constructive discussions. I understand, of course, the situation of UEFA in Europe, the whole situation with the various stakeholders, with the leaguers, with the clubs, small clubs, big clubs and um, the players, uh, trade unions, is much more complicated than in other parts of the world. Maybe that's why it took a bit more time, but we have taken up the dialogue again. We're discussing, we're in football after all, and in football we're not waging war against each other. Hence, I'm confident that also with UEFA and all European clubs, we can have a good and fruitful cooperation in the future. Many thanks. Rob Harris. Hi. Um, 
One, one side on the Club World Cup, one on the uh, main World Cup. Um, on the Club World Cup, do we have a host for 2019 this year yet? Not yet. No. But okay. soon. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, um, on the, uh, the funding, the 25 billion, you got the big offer in for the Club World Cup, the Global Nations League. What happens now? Who's going to fund this uh, pilot tournament in 2021? Uh, How much are you hoping to generate from that? And then on the 2022 World Cup, uh, in terms of the expansion, obviously it's quite logistically challenged in terms of what our man has and even Kuwait has, perhaps it's alcohol ban, which could be prohibitive for you. Do you really need the UAE to make this succeed to have another, um, you know, to have this expansion? And have you had any indication that uh, this decision to progress with the World Cup uh, expansion can contribute to the boycott blockade being lifted of Qatar? What was the first question? Ah, on the 25 billion. Yeah, I, I hope it will be much more than 25 billion that we generate with the Club World Cup. But I don't think so. Maybe a little bit less. We will see. You know, we had first to take a decision on the sporting side and on whether we go ahead with this um, plan of this uh, new revamped Club World Cup. Decision we took today. So as of today or as of tomorrow, uh, maybe it's weekend, so as of Monday, we will start uh, working on the commercialization of this uh, um, of this Club World Cup to see what uh, the market brings us. And uh, I'm very, very optimistic. I mean, let's not forget that the National Team World Cup uh, generates close to six or even more than six billion um, US dollars. And in the National Team World Cup, potentially, you don't even have some of the best players who um, who participate, right? Because uh, let's look at the last World Cup, for example. If Argentina doesn't win the last game in Ecuador, uh, Messi will not participate. If uh, Portugal doesn't beat Switzerland in the last qualifying games, maybe Ronaldo doesn't uh, participate. We had many great players in the history, George Best, George Weah, who never played in a World Cup because they didn't have strong enough teammates. Now, all these great players, they play for the top teams in the world. I was watching yesterday here, uh, day before yesterday here on TV, the, the, the game between Bayern Munich and um, Liverpool. And after the game, I don't know which channel showed it, I don't remember, but they showed the eight teams that qualified with the name of the team and the player, representative, representative player of the team. Well, I can tell you not half of them were European. So this shows that there is uh, you know, a great variety of football players in the best teams. The best players will play in the best teams in Europe today, tomorrow hopefully also in, uh, uh, in other continents. We shouldn't have just six, seven, eight or ten teams from four or five countries being able to compete at the top. We should have 50 teams from 15 countries who can uh, compete at the top level. That's how we need to think about developing football in the future. And having, uh, I don't know, an Egyptian player playing for Liverpool makes that 450 million Arabs are cheering for Liverpool and are proud that one of them is playing in a top competition and potentially can become even world champion in, in, the, new, um, in the new World Cup. Um, I don't know if I, if this answers uh, your question, or if I'm, I'm, or if I'm off the track. But, but uh, uh, I think it's important to realize this, you know, this potential. Every football, you are a football fan. So what does it mean? You are a fan of your national team, right? Of your country, your flag. You are a fan of a club in your country, a local club. Well, you're lucky to be in one of the big countries, so your local club is also one of these world clubs. But all those who are not so lucky like you, who are from maybe smaller countries, well, they are cheering for one of their clubs and one of these big, big world clubs, and they are happy uh, if, um, uh, if the results are there. So I think this will reflect very, very positively on, on the future of, uh, of football. On uh, 2022, uh, world Cup, 
yeah, it is, it is uh, uh, challenging. As I was saying, we are in the lucky situation that I can speak to anyone in the Gulf region and uh, talk just about football. I know that I'm not that naive to not know that there are uh, you know, political issues, that there is blockade and this and that. But, and I don't even want to say that football might help to build some bridges or to bring people together or these kind of things. I just think that it's important for the whole region in the Gulf that the World Cup 2022 in Qatar will be a success. It is important for a region which uh, uh, today, unfortunately, is uh, on the headlines more for negative than for positive in many in many aspects because of prejudices that many have around the world. And I'm sure that when people discover this part of the world, Qatar, neighboring countries, Oman, uh, Kuwait, UAE, whatever, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, they will discover, uh, yes, that it's, these countries are certainly different from Western Europe or the Western hemisphere, but that there are people living there as well, like you and me, people who want to enjoy, people who want to celebrate, people who would be proud to welcome the world, to show them their countries, to show them what they can do, how they can host. And you know, maybe, yes, maybe that the World Cup can contribute a little bit uh, to this. I think it will be in any case, whether it's a World Cup with 32 teams only in Qatar or whether it's a World Cup with 48 teams in Qatar and some neighboring countries, because those who will be traveling there will certainly have the opportunity as well to uh, visit uh, other countries. And I think, you know, maybe that this is good for football and maybe it can also be good for a region which is important for the world more generally, but this goes beyond football. And I think if football can contribute to uh, open up some doors and to make people meet and discuss with each other, well, we'll not solve all the problems of the world, by far not, but maybe we'll get a little step closer in at least starting to understand each other a bit. That's the ambition. We have a question in the second row. And then the very last question will go to Agence France Presse. Don't ask me why, Eric Bernardo. Um, my name is Rosangela Denise from Go News, a magazine headquarters here in Miami. Where are you? Sorry. Ah, here. OK, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the first question is, uh, this money allocated for the football development will be equally divided for men and women? Second question, to the World Cup in Qatar, already feasibility for 48 teams, and also, uh, will, be, will FIFA consider to putting a clause uh, referring 48 teams if they accept this joint hosting? This way can really help the region because in, in Middle East, they all love soccer. It is um, their common language, regardless of their political. So is the, in this study, put in a requirement for joint hosting of 22 if it goes for 48 teams? On the 22 uh, World Cup, Yes, if, if, if it goes to 48 teams and it will be co-hosted, uh, this means majority, of course, in, in Qatar and a few games in uh, some of the neighboring countries. Let's see which countries. Then uh, this can certainly contribute to uh, uh, maybe also a, bit, a little bit of a better understanding between the people. But Beside of that, as you rightly say, uh, football is what really unites this part of the world. There are many, many football lovers in this part of the world. And uh, as FIFA, we have to be inclusive. And we want to be inclusive. And we want to include everyone. And I know that there are issues. 
And I know that there are issues in that part of the world and in many other parts of the world as well. But football can contribute to bring people together, to open the eyes and to celebrate uh, a World Cup, which is the biggest event on earth, not only the biggest football event, the biggest event on earth in uh, a part of the world, which uh, will be discovered, as it was the case for Russia last year, which will be discovered as part of the world that can welcome, that can uh, make people enjoy. And I think, as I was saying before, it is an important uh, part of the world, especially today with all the issues we have around uh, migrations and, and, and religions and all these kind of topics. It's important that through football we can uh, help and, and uh, uh, open a little bit the eyes. I spoke recently, I was uh, honored to speak at the G20 meeting to the 20 most powerful heads of state of the world and speaking about football, about not only the economic but also and most importantly social element and impact that football can have around the world. This is important. It's not just words. It's important because it's a tool for health. It's a tool for education. And the leaders of the world also recognize this and see this. And the World Cup is certainly a unique opportunity. And you cannot imagine how many people, when I'm traveling in the Gulf region, are coming to me and are telling me, ah, you bring us the World Cup to the whole region. And I'm saying, well, we will see. At the end, it will be a FIFA Congress decision. And before that, we work together with our Qatari partners to find the best way forward. The other question was? How about the money? Ah, the money, well, yes. Well, actually, for the, well, it's, it's uh, distributed in equal parts to all 211 countries in the world for the big, big uh, chunk of it. There is a part of it as well for uh, those who are in most need, for example, for travel costs uh, or for uh, um, equipment costs. If you are in an African country and you have to travel to your neighboring country, often you have to travel through Europe, so back and forth. So this is very, very costly. And we are helping them as well. And for the first time now in the new forward program, we have the same amounts uh, dedicated and earmarked uh, for men competition and for women competition, which need to be organized by uh, the member associations. We still have, I don't know, 60, 50, 60 associations in the world who do not have proper women's football. Well, they will receive less money. Thank you. Monsieur le Président, bonjour. Sir, vous aviez échappé une question en français. Je, suis, je, je vais vous la poser. Going to put a question in French. Two questions, in fact, sir. If you go on to 48 teams in Qatar, aren't you afraid that there will be uh, appeals from other bidders? Because that's a major change of format, and uh, bidding uh, wasn't based on that. So will there be appeals? Uh, is that going to be normal? You attended the uh, Reform Committee of FIFA. You were elected on the basis of reforming FIFA to bring in more transparency and democracy. Your predecessor was uh, criticized for being too autocratic and ruling supreme. You're the only candidate uh, for re-election. Is that a good sign? Wouldn't you have uh, preferred an opponent, for example, so that there would be a real democratic debate? No. <laughs> We've had the, a democratic debate, and that's perhaps why. There are no other candidates. At FIFA, we now have executive summits. We've held 12 this year, and we meet all the presidents and uh, general secretaries of all the 211 national federations in order to discuss matters and listen to each other to learn. And then we have to take decisions. I was elected. I hope I'll be re-elected to take further decisions and to further shoulder my responsibilities. I think the outcome of the last three years, which began in 
a rather in rather difficult uh, circumstances as to where FIFA stood. I think the the overall situation is now extremely positive, and people around the world have seen this and appreciated the change. For me, the fact I'm the only candidate certainly does not mean, and I uh, said this to all the. Uh, MAs at the summits, that's not going to mean that I'm just going to sit back in my chair, go off on holiday and make the most of the situation. On the contrary, I'm going to work even harder. I'll work uh, even more. I'll do everything I can to ensure that football develops on a global basis. People often say is that, foot that football is the only worldwide sport. There shouldn't be just a little elite in some countries. Football is for everyone. And in five or ten years' time, I'd like there to be 50 teams around the world who could well become world champions, or 50 clubs in the world who could become the club champion. And that's what we need to work on. These are our goals. This is our vision. The fact that I'm the only candidate gives me even more energy to continue working in this direction. And then you asked about the football format, the 48 teams. May there be legal appeals, for example? Well, when there are lawyers there are always situations where there may be work for those lawyers to do. Given how FIFA is now managed, uh, lawyers have much less work. So as to your specific question, obviously deciding to increase the number of teams is not an easy decision to take. You don't take it in a light-hearted manner. You, uh, uh, this was submitted to Congress, which is the supreme body. And we talked about the matter with all the MAs, including those who uh, uh, were candidates. And everybody, or 90% of the MAs, uh, were in favor of uh, this increase. Obviously, we studied the matter. We wanted to see whether we could increase the number of teams, whether we could develop a football more quickly than has been the case so far. We're not afraid of uh, appeals, and, but I'm quite optimistic because we are working for the football as a whole. Our first partner in this overall discussion was Qatar, which won the uh, bid, the right to organize the, the cup uh, comprising 32 teams. We're very, very pleased to see, to see how open-minded they have been. We're happy to work with them. And we'll see whether solutions uh, can be found. And we hope they will be positive uh, uh, solutions for the world at large. President, that was the last question. Allow me also to thank the CONCACAF and U.S. soccer colleagues for their support. Thank you. Have a good afternoon, good weekend, safe travels wherever you go. Thank you very much. Safe travel back home. Bye-bye.